let me say that I swear on the souls of my grandchildren that I will not be the one to break the peace we've made here today. Immortalized by the Godfather, the commission has been the center of power for organized crime for 60 years. Up through the 1980s, mob bosses like Fat Tony Salerno, Junior Persico, and Tony Dux Corallo used the commission to control everything from construction to garbage to labor unions in New York City. What they were was kind of like the United Nations of the Mafia, where the leaders of the families got together and made certain decisions to coordinate their criminal activity. The commission was created in 1931, allegedly by the notorious Lucky Luciano. His purpose was to prevent mob wars and to regulate dealings between the five New York City crime families. But with so many mob bosses now behind bars or under investigation, it is no longer necessary nor wise for the commission to operate. In 1986, Michael Chertoff, then a prosecutor for then U.S. Attorney Rudolph Giuliani, showed a jury these photographs of commission members leaving a meeting at a house in Staten Island. The commission case was the beginning of the end. There had never been a case before then that proved the existence of a national mafia organization that controls organized crime families all across the country. John Gotti further diminished the commission's credibility by having his boss, Paul Castellano, murdered without commission approval. Angelo Sonny Mercurio, considered by his closest friends to be an absolute stand-up mob guy, was asked today if he was an informant. Mercurio replied in a clear, loud voice, Yes. That admission seems to lend support to the defense of reputed mob boss Francis Cadillac Frank Salemi and four others that the government may have lied or withheld evidence from a judge in 1989. That judge approved the wiretap, which recorded a mafia induction ceremony considered one of the FBI's biggest successes of all time. Now that tape may be excluded, jeopardizing the government's case. It's a very important piece of a mosaic that we're going to build in to argue that there have been outrageous government misconduct in this case and ask for a dismissal of all the charges. What, uh, what happened today, I think, is going to be a, a sort of a watershed event in the sense that we are now going to finally find out just what really happens and how the government goes about getting these wiretap orders and if they're doing it correctly. And again, it's an if. We intend to prove, and it's our position, that that they conducted uh, their, set themselves in an illegal manner. As an OG, plenty guns and more smarts, though darts. I'm built on bumps and bruises, bump losers is what y'all losers news is. But I got a different forecast, you bastard. I'm well trained at keeping it blasted. Got knowledge from Muhammad, Noah, pure for sure. And shorty dog pumping shells through your door. Hands up like the party is rocking, we in your pocket. Cause it all is free, shit, it's time to stop it. I used to beat a bootlegger to death, now I gotta send a legal letter. I think the fans ought to treat me better. These rap niggas say, bump in a top five. Well, fuck you, your top five, any slut wise. <laughs> These IP killers, I want to crack their schnauzers, log on Now everybody want to be philosophic Well let me fill you with a real topic Everybody love hip hop or saying they do So I make it with Primo and play it for you And while you sitting there, eyes closed, loving the feeling Your man's on the laptop stealing That's like a kick in the groin piece The fan thief, the sound bite Something just don't sound right So now you making excuses like I'm a fan And I deserve to pick fruit from the tree yeah, well y'all keep picking, I keep fighting, you keep stealing, I keep writing And real niggas do real shit and hip hop like saying what the fuck it really is and not biting <laughs> Yeah, we are at war. rock on, we are on, on, on Y'all know what it is
Lenny and Whitey Bulger were the perfect guests and brought bottles of wine or fancy stemware when they came to his home, where he would whip up fancy Italian cuisine to feed the gangsters while his wife was out of town. Gianturco said he and fellow agent John Connolly exchanged Christmas presents with the gangsters. I didn't want to insult Mr. Bulger and say, I don't want this, take it back. At the time, I didn't think there was anything wrong with it. Gianturco added ruefully, it was a mistake in judgment. There were uh, uh, three individuals that uh, actually uh, uh, were killed due to my uh, infiltration into the mafia. At Gian Turco's home at another dinner party, Flemmie and Bulger were introduced to celebrity FBI agent Joseph Pistone. Pistone had written a book about penetrating the mafia using the undercover name of Donnie Brasco. Last year, Hollywood made a movie depicting his undercover exploits. Sometimes it just means... Uh... Steve Flemmie's affidavit is explosive, alleging at one point that Flemmie and Whitey Bulger may become so friendly with one of their FBI handlers, they actually gave him money. The Fleming affidavit alleges that a meeting with the agent, Agent John Morris said he was having serious financial problems and that Bulger and Fleming loaned Agent Morris $5,000 in cash that we had with us. Fleming's affidavit says the money was never repaid and there's no record of it. At the trial, Judge Mark Wolf is going to have to decide whether Fleming was promised immunity from prosecution in exchange for acting as an FBI informant. In exchange for that, his affidavit alleges the two men enjoyed a special relationship with the FBI, which included warnings to them. He charges, from at least 1969 through 1995, it was the practice of the FBI to advise James Bulger and or me of pending criminal indictments and investigations. From 1967 until last year, the FBI regularly arrested the leaders of the Boston Mafia based on wiretaps, all set up by FBI informant Stephen Flemmie and his partner, James Whitey Bulger, now a fugitive. Flemmie is a defendant, and he claims he did the FBI's bidding for 30 years under a promise of immunity, and now has been betrayed. And everything he had been promised by the FBI occurred. They dismissed a murder case, they dismissed a uh, attempted murder case, and they dismissed a federal uh, flight to avoid prosecution. Um, that, so all those promise. things occurred. That promise was delivered. The government said Fleming and Bulger had no immunity. Their motive for informing was to knock out the competition. But Fleming himself will take the stand, according to his lawyer. Doesn't that expose him to some danger? Uh, I don't think so. If he tells the truth, and he will, I'm not concerned about any dangers. But the FBI might be concerned if Fleming can prove allegations that an agent took $5,000 from him and Bulger and that the two were tipped off to wiretaps and arrest. The other defendants claim the FBI's secret dealings with informants Fleming and Bulger cast a terminal taint on the wiretaps, which account for most of the evidence against them. And it is our contention that um, this enterprise doesn't exist, that his loyalty was with the FBI, and that the very foundation for this prosecution, you know, rests on very fragile territory. John A. Gotti, or Junior as he's known, got a taste of what it's like to be a reputed mob boss today. He got locked up. And he could be headed for a long family reunion with his dapper dad, who's doing life in federal prison. Gotti and a long procession of reputed goodfellas were led in handcuffs into the Yonkers armory today as Gotti's outraged lawyer protested. It's appalling the way they've handled this thing. They like to make the media circus. I'll respond to it. I'm going to go find out what the charges are. But in the federal courthouse, the mood among law enforcement officials was one of elation. Yet another generation at the top of the Gambino family chart will soon be gone. Whether it be Paul Castellano, John Gotti, or Junior Gotti, it doesn't pay to be number one. Junior Gotti became a reputed boss of the Gambino crime family when his father was sent away in 1993. Many predicted he'd be dead within months. Mob experts say he's not held in high regard by fellow gangsters. He doesn't have the same amount of respect in terms of uh, uh, the ability. I don't think he's considered. Oh! Officer Ralph Doles, just 28 years old and four years on the force, received a full inspector's funeral. City officials came to pay their respects, but it was the faces of his fellow housing police officers that best captured the sad occasion. It hurts the most. We don't know why he was uh, killed, why he was taken away from us. 
Uh, there's no way that he could have made an enemy. He doesn't have the ability to make an enemy. Do's young stepson, openly sobbing, arrived with his mother, Kim Kanoa, obviously touched. Housing cops, in a spontaneous gesture, signed an NYPD baseball hat for the grieving boy. It's just actually showing the love we felt for Ralph, everybody who was here and attended, signed this is for his son, his stepson, Eddie. So we'll give this to him later on. It's a memento to keep as a keepsake from all of us to him. Doles was ambushed and killed gangland style after his shift Monday night outside his Sheep's Head Bay home. Today, there were no new breaks in the search for his killers, only new pledges. Inside the church, Police Commissioner Safer told the widow and the mourners, we will not rest until whoever is responsible for this is put under arrest. But that's proving an elusive goal. I wish there was a swift arrest. I wish it was done the night it happened, but unfortunately it didn't. So now it's just time. Time will tell all. Published reports claim Doles told fellow officers before he died he recognized two of his three attackers, but he didn't know their names. Police investigators are left looking for possible links to Russian mobs or to organized crime. Officer Doles widow is no stranger to tragedy. Her first husband, a reputed mobster, was also shot dead ten years ago. They'll find them. It's just a matter of time, but it'll come out. Chris O'Donoghue, UPN 9 News. I would prefer not to suppress evidence or dismiss a case as a sanction, federal judge Mark Wolf said, but this whole case, he went on to say, is about the credibility of what the United States government tells federal judges. And with that, Wolf, a former federal prosecutor himself, began a contentious hearing on whether to force the government to reveal whether figures like Anthony St. Laurent Were you a snitch for the no, FBI? No, never. Were FBI informants. Did you ever think you, that you would he see a hearing like this? No, thing? never, never. At issue is whether the government misled the court when seeking the court's permission to eavesdrop on reputed mob figures. Those wiretaps led to the convictions of some of New England's most notorious members of organized crime. What's at stake is potentially a pattern of misconduct on the part of the government in getting Title III uh, intercept orders by, uh, by basically misleading the judges and uh, <clears throat> hiding informants as uh, targets or subjects when they're really not. They're really working for the government. Reputed New England crime boss Frank Salemi and several others are charged in the massive federal racketeering indictment, which relies on, like many similar prosecutions, on a now famous recording of a mafia induction ceremony. But Judge Wolf says evidence now shows the FBI used false statements to obtain that wiretap and allowed its informants to commit crimes while on the government payroll. I sentenced one of those alleged informants to nine years in prison. I thought he was a real criminal, Judge Wolf said angrily. Just because an individual is an informant doesn't mean he's not a real criminal, Prosecutor Fred Ryshack responded, a statement that drew laughter from spectators. Ryshack says divulging the names of the informants could have significant impact on the FBI's informant program. The government continues to refuse to name its informants, despite the prospect of possibly being held in contempt of court. Two of the reported informants may be compelled to testify in a hearing full of suspense and huge possible impact on past, present, and future organized crime cases. Police now say what appeared to be the killing of livery cab driver Satinderjit Singh following a traffic altercation was really a mob-style hit. Prosecutors say the execution was orchestrated by the owner of City Gas, Ramit Singh Dinsa, a 35-year-old Indian immigrant. Dinsa allegedly hired two of his employees, Marvin Dodson, the alleged trigger man, and Walter Samuel, the alleged driver, and paid them $20,000 to kill his former employee to shut him up. Uh, he uh, is alleged to have believed uh, that uh, the victim of the homicide, Mr. Singh, uh, was cooperating with law enforcement authorities, that he was providing information to them with regard to his, uh, uh, his uh, uh, having witnessed uh, a uh, homicide in which the brother of the owner had been involved. Prosecutors say the owner of City Gas was also afraid the victim was giving information about his alleged scheme to defraud customers by rigging his gas pumps to overcharge them and underpaying state taxes. According to prosecutors, the City Gas owner's brother was jailed in connection with the 1991 Queens homicide. The complaint also alleges the owner routinely resorted to violence to protect his lucrative business, including at least two other murders. Customers at a City Gas station in Queens declined to appear on camera, but said the owner's reputation was widely known in the Indian community. Everybody knows in the community he's a tough guy. 
uh, everybody knows this, you know, they say that they, he killed at least 10 to 12 people. They say that he committed murders. What do you think? I don't know about that. Prosecutors say a raid on the company's Brooklyn warehouse turned up numerous weapons and bulletproof vests. New York One has learned investigators are looking into at least six other murders, including one at a city gas station in Chelsea last month. Sources tell New York One they are also probing alleged links to the Gambino crime family and Russian organized crime, two groups that generally control the illegal gas industry. In the meantime, Dinsa and the two men he allegedly hired to conduct the execution have all been jailed by the feds and are being held without bail. Defendant Anthony Clemente said he went to the 99 restaurant that day to save his son and a friend, both co-defendants, from a confrontation with the Louises and the Sorrows. When he got there, they were seated. Kids were coming this way. Roman was standing right in front of me. Pulled him behind me out of the line of fire. This kid here was reaching. Roman, Roman Louisi was reaching. You fired first at Roman Louisi. Yes. And then you turned and fired at another person. Yes. Who was that? That was uh, the fella, Sonny Pelosi. And then who did you fire at next? Real fast, Bobby and, and, and uh, Robert Luisi Sr. and Sonny Pelosi rose almost at the same time. Him and Bobby stand up, but Sonny stands up first. I shot Sonny first. Bobby up. Him. Shot him dead. Bobby's already up, reaching for me. I have to put my hand out, pull the gun back. I shoot him dead. Looked around the corner, seen it was Roman. Shot him again in the back. Took a better aim shot, shot him in the back of the head. Now I turn to hunt the sixth guy. Did you see him? Couldn't find him. Moved back towards the table 45. Sorrow's moving. Shot him again. Which Sorrow? Anthony. It appears that when it comes to John Gotti Jr., it's father like son, a man of few words. Can't go to work anymore, it seems. He said, you can't go to work anymore, it seems. Police say John Gotti Jr. was not on his way to work when they arrested him last night. This is his auto glass shop in Coney Island. Workers and customers there today shrugged and smiled and brushed off questions about the boss's arrest. I really don't know what happened. Well, I know somebody was arrested last night. Yeah, Scotty Son or something. Huh? How about John Jr.? No. Do you know anything at all? Of course, everybody knows him. Yeah. yeah. Were you here last night? Of course. So, were they, were the cops hassling? Was it? No, 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 man, man. I'm with the FBI. No? Many say John Jr. has taken over as head of the Gambino crime family since his father, the so-called Dapper Don, was sent to jail for life. Last night, the young Gotti had his latest run-in with the cops. It started about 6 o'clock. Two undercover cops were sitting in an unmarked car outside Gotti's store. They were setting up a drug buy and bust thing in the neighborhood. That's when this man, John Ruggiero, a friend of Gotti's, allegedly came out of the auto glass store and verbally attacked the officers. The cops charged him with obstruction of government administration. After dropping him off at the 60th precinct, the cops noticed their unmarked car was being followed at this intersection in the Gravesend section. Police say it was here the undercover detectives turned on the vehicle trailing them and stopped it. They searched the vehicle and arrested Gotti Jr. and his driver, 29-year-old Stephen Kaplan. Both men faced the same obstruction charge. They were released this morning and must go back to court in 30 days. Until then, John Jr. remains a man of few words, especially when it comes to reporters. I'm sorry, Mr. Esconi, that's it. Chris O'Donoghue, UPN. Boss of the Colombo crime family. Here are pictures of them being walked out today. Dennis Hickey, uh, the large, or uh, excuse me, the uh, boss of the Colombo crime family, Andrew, Andrew Russo, was uh, brought out first, and then Dennis Hickey, along with his son and his wife. Uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office alleges that uh, Russo, Hickey, and four other defendants, along with his wife and son, uh, operated his garbage collection business in Suffolk County through a pattern of racketeering, including money laundering and fraud against, against the town of Islip. They are seeking to uh, take $15 million in assets from Hickey uh, that uh, apparently what they say was earned uh, illegally. Now, you remember, may remember that Hickey was best known for his Supreme very Court battle. A very important uh, indictment. It is a continuance of this city's law enforcement effort 
uh, with federal, state, and local law enforcement uh, authorities to arrest organized crime control of a lot of areas. The San Gennaro Feast is an institution uh, that is revered by many in this city and draws people from all over the world. Uh, the fact that it has been used as a organized crime enterprise is something that uh, really uh, was deplorable and needed to be dealt with. I want to congratulate the FBI, the Organized Crime Control Bureau, and the Internal Revenue Service. This, along with the efforts uh, in trade waste and in the Fulton Fish Market, is going to give a signal to organized crime uh, that this city is no longer hospitable. The court papers accuse the defendants of engaging in many of the traditional crimes committed by uh, Cosa Nostra groups, murder, extortion, labor racketeering, gambling, loan sharking, money laundering, obstruction of justice, and tax evasion. The indictment even reveals how the Genovese organized crime family used the facade of a religious festival, the Feast of San Gennaro, to mask the object of their true devotion, uh, which is the almighty dollar. Uh, this investigation and resulting indictments is another major step along the way towards reducing the power and influence of organized crime in the New York metropolitan area. Uh, agents of the FBI and, of course, the IRS uh, and the United States Attorney's Office for bringing about a significant investigation and certainly culminating in this uh, uh, indictment. I'm pleased uh, from an IRS standpoint that uh, we were able to contribute uh, to this investigation. Hopefully it will lead to convictions in all counts. And uh, uh, these people are, uh, they're out there for themselves. They don't take from the rich and give to the poor. They take from everybody and they give to themselves. And it doesn't make any difference whether it's uh, what cost of it is in life or dignity or human property. So uh, this is a, an extremely important uh, in, uh, indictment on uh, the Genovese. I thank you. Any questions? Yes. Paramedics could do little to help reputed mobster Ernie Biandello. A shotgun blast to the back of the head ended his life this morning, just days before his 54th birthday. Obviously, it's an ambush. He, he traveled our route uh, every day. Police found Biandello slumped behind the wheel of this new Cadillac on Murdoch Street on the east side. Reportedly, he was on his way to work at the United Music Company on Wilson Avenue. The car's windows blasted out, glass and shotgun casings littering the street. A car in front of him stopped. Another car was traveling behind him, uh, stopped boxing him in. Three or four perpetrators then got out of the vehicles and uh, walked up to his vehicle and shot repeatedly. Police say one of the suspect's cars was left at the scene that had been stolen recently in Niles. While the suspects left quickly, there were no witnesses. I just heard a, a loud, uh, like, bang. It sounded basically like a hammer hitting a piece of wood. Didn't sound like a gunshot? No. Biandello was well known to authorities, an arrest record dating back to the mid-60s, this mugshot taken back in 1982 when he was arrested by the FBI. Police tell us Biandello was a close personal friend of murdered records figure Joey Naples and even took over Naples United Music Company on the east side right after Naples was killed. Biandello was even the contractor on the mansion Naples was building in Beaver Township when he died. While police believe Biandello also took a piece of local organized crime interests, most recently he was more visible concerning his vending business, interviewed by Eyewitness News just two weeks ago. There are only 1% of the sales of the cigarette company. The last few years, uh, he hasn't been involved in any criminality that I, that I know of. But the FBI will take note. This is considered the second mob hit in Mahoning County this year, after tavern owner Larry Seisman of Boardman was gunned down outside his Lockwood Boulevard apartment in March. Jerry Ricciuti, 33 they Iowa. arrived with FBI escorts to have their day in court. Men the feds say are involved in the most significant organized crime family in the United States. 
Mobsters, they claim they've been trying to bust for years. Organized crime is still a cruel and destructive element in America's social fabric. As the arrest in Detroit demonstrate, it remains a priority of the Justice Department. These four men are among 17 of Detroit's La Cosa Nostra crime family indicted today. The four were arrested right here in South Florida this morning in Palm Beach and North Broward. I'd rather live next to people like that than live to uh, bad people. In fact, knowing that they're there, you feel more safe. <laughs> what can I tell you? Because nobody will bother you. The men arrested here, 69-year-old Jack William Toko, the alleged mob boss, 68-year-old Anthony Joseph Zerilli, the man Fed say was second in charge, 64-year-old Anthony Joseph Toko, and 78-year-old Paul Joseph Toko. A Detroit federal grand jury indicted the group on 25 different charges. Prosecutors claim Detroit's La Cosa Nostra family committed several acts of violence, extortion, and racketeering. The alleged crimes took place, they say, over a 30-year period. They include infiltrating Las Vegas casinos, plotting murders and beatings, and corrupting officials. This has been a five-year investigation by the FBI in Michigan, as well as the uh, Michigan State Police and Michigan Attorney General uh, cooperated with the FBI there. We've been notified that this 25-count indictment was a result of this extensive investigation. I think it speaks for itself that there are powers working to keep me from being able to be part of the Teamsters Union. That's Jimmy Hoffa with Tampa lawyer Regano, who was also so-called house counsel to the mob, and the late Santo Traficante, the Florida mafia boss. He's written a book detailing his mob ties, disclosing Traficante told him that the executioners were three men from the Tony Provenzano mob in New Jersey. The mob didn't want Hoffa back in power because it would restrict Mafia access to the billion-dollar Teamster pension fund. Tony Provenzano had him killed. The three guys that uh, really killed him uh, were Sal and Gabe uh, Brigilio and Tommy Andretta, and they were Tony Pro's men. More than Hoffa being a mob hit, Regano says JFK was as well, that the mob wanted the administration off its back, that Traficanti and another mobster orchestrated the assassination using Regano as a messenger between mobsters. By then, Regano says he'd crossed the line between being a lawyer and being a friend of his clients. Their friends became my friends, and their enemies became my enemies. I detested the Kennedys for violating my client's constitutional rights. Consequently, on the night that he was assassinated, I was very happy. Why should Regano stick his neck out now? The mob's just the same and has a flawless memory. 72 years of age. I'm in ill health. I have multiple heart problems. And I owe an awful lot to this country. All right, this is the uh, culmination of a major investigation going over a five-year period by the New York City uh, Police Department and the Manhattan DA's office into, uh, into a criminal organization that's had a major negative impact on the economic uh, uh, viability of this city. Uh, the leadership of the organized crime control cartel that has long dominated the private carding industry in New York has been indicted and arrested. Private carters provide waste removal services for virtually all non-residential establishments in New York City. Indicted and arrested today for enterprise corruption and related crimes are four trade associations, seven individuals, and 23 carting companies, which allegedly banded together into a cartel to restrain competition and keep carters' prices and profits artificially high. According to the indictment, the cartel's basic rule was that no carter be permitted to compete for the business of a customer serviced by another carter. The cartel, led by members and associates of the Gambino and Genovese organized crime families, enforced this rule by acts of violence, including attempted murder, assault and arson, threats of violence, and concerted economic pressure. It has long been an open secret that the private carding industry in this city has been dominated by organized crime, which has reaped enormous economic rewards by preventing any meaningful competition for customers.
Today, we are taking the first steps toward eliminating that cartel. In addition to today's indictments and arrests, the District Attorney's Office filed an asset forfeiture action in New York State Supreme Court civil term seeking recovery of the proceeds of the defendant's crimes in the amount of $268 million. Earlier this week, Acting Supreme Court Justice Walter Shackman signed emergency orders attaching the assets of the 44 defendants in the amount of $268 million to prevent them from being transferred or dissipated. Justice Shackman also granted the District Attorney's request for the appointment of temporary receivers to oversee and manage the businesses and properties of 22 of the 23 corporate defendants, as well as the four associations to ensure that they are run in a lawful manner. I hope they fry. Stephen White is one victim's brother-in-law, and he owns the house where both of them lived. White says he didn't see anything unusual up in this hollow, but he thinks he knows why it happened. This Tetros trailer was ripped off, and some, some of the stolen goods had been bought by somebody that was staying with John. So you think he got blamed for something he didn't do? Oh, yeah, definitely. Volunteers from three county rescue squads dragged the lake bottom all day. The curious, and even one relative of a suspect, stood near the bridge to watch. You can do anything you want to, or, or, or get anything done you want to. Yeah. You know, you don't... There's, there's people here from big towns. Yeah. You know, it ain't like it used to be when I was a boy growing up. Yeah. There's all kinds of people here anymore. It's a tough search, though. The water's over 100 feet deep here, with plenty of rocks and snags on the bottom. They're finding a lot of parts of cars, uh, string wheels, uh, carpets that's been dropped into the lake. Um, they're doing a good job of getting it. I think we're cleaning the lake pretty good right now. Not finding what you're looking for, though. Not finding what we're looking for. We're operating now on eyewitness information that we believe definitely the bodies are in the lake off Hurricane Bridge. They're looking for the bodies of 26-year-old John Harry and 18-year-old Roger Zamet. Sheriff Pack says the two were kidnapped separately and taken to this trailer south of Smithville, a trailer which caught fire not long after the murders. The trailer's owner, 26-year-old Chris Catro, is one of the six suspects in jail tonight. Police say Harry and Zamet were kept here, beaten and tortured for at least two days, then killed and dumped in the lake. The bodies were injured, physically injured, before death. <clears throat> Can you say how? No, not this time. The water is deep, the bottom full of rocks and snags, and searchers dragged one small area for close to two days without finding the bodies of 26-year-old John Harry and 18-year-old Roger Zamet, who police say were kidnapped, murdered, and thrown off this bridge nearly two weeks ago. But this morning, the highway patrol brought in an underwater camera hooked to a TV monitor. And about 3.30 this afternoon, a state trooper watching that screen saw what he was looking for. Police and prosecutors said earlier that finding the bodies would just about sew up an already strong case against the six suspects. I don't want to um, brag about my case yet because there's a lot, a long way to go before trial, and I'm sure a lot more information to come up. But um, we're, we're real, the TBI and the DeKalb County Sheriff's Department has done an excellent job, and I'm real happy with the evidence we have right now. One suspect's attorney says his client, Kenny Mason of Gordonsville, is already telling police what he knows. We're trying to do our best to uh, at this point in time to uh, straighten up matters and, uh, and cooperate with the police and, and try to help them uh, bring this to a conclusion. Police are saying just a little more today about how Harry and Zamet died. The TBI says they were taken to several other locations, abused but still alive, and that as many as 20 people saw them before they were killed. They were abused somewhat um, during certain parts of the, that time. I mean, they were being taken around so other people could see them in that condition? Um, well, yes and no. Um, I really don't want to get into all the details on that, but as to actually watching the uh, homicides take place, uh, other than the six that we've got charged right now, we don't have any other information in, in reference to that. So as many as 20 people saw them being abused one way or another at different times? That's correct. The indictment alleges that Frank Salemi, as head of the powerful Patriarcha crime family, coordinated the activities of that family with the Winter Hill Gang, allegedly run by South Boston's James Whitey Bulger and Stephen Flemmy of Quincy. Together or separately, these groups sought to um, uh, promote and uh, control illegal activity through violence and fear. 
The indictment lists seven defendants, all charged with violating two counts of the RICO racketeering statute. Other charges include extortion, including requiring monthly payments from legal and illegal businesses, conspiracy, loan sharking, and witness tampering. I emphasize that these are indictments and we still have yet to come a number of important steps, uh, including obviously uh, obtaining convictions. If successful, we, deal that we believe this will de deal a serious blow to organized crime in, in Massachusetts. The 90-page indictment dates back to 1965. Stephen Flemmy and another defendant, Robert DeLuca, have been arrested and were in court today. And DeLuca's attorney was unimpressed by the lengthy indictment. It's, it's really kind of uh, the Greenpeace movement in, uh, in federal law enforcement. It's a recycling of, uh, of much of what's been around for years. Officials say two of the defendants are expected to surrender. Two are in custody, and one has been on the lam for years. The two highest-profile defendants Salemi and Bulger remain at large. Mr. Fleming and Mr. Bulger are out there thinking that they've escaped the net. Uh, the strong message is that law enforcement will continue the effort uh, until we get them. Tony Sinto used to cut Vincent Carboni's hair. He told me that he was from New Jersey or something. Actually, what we used to talk a lot about is his uh, grandmother's Italian cooking. And when Carboni stopped at Shirley Termelli's place for pizza, he had an explanation for his scarred features. He said he was in a car accident or something like that. Got in a bad accident and had some problems. What they didn't know is that the Vincent Carboni who had just moved to Chisholm was in fact Dominic Costa, a former mafia safecracker from New York. He rented an apartment right across the street from the First National Bank. And police say in April, Carboni and an associate broke into the building from the second floor and tried to drill down into the bank. When that failed, they broke into a safe in Luciani's law office. Old-time Italian family and usually had some cash, and I uh, had some silver from my mother's estate. Carboni got away with $40,000 in cash and coins, but police say they were able to quickly arrest him because he bragged about his exploits. If he had any sense at all, he'd have just kept his mouth shut. And he could have lived here and, uh, and nobody would know. But today in Chisholm, everybody is talking about the mafia safecracker who came to their hometown. I think they were very surprised, shocked that a man like that would be in such a small community. I think he's just a thief. <laughs> I don't think it was a challenge. He's just a thief. <laughs> the family of Anna Lizarraga knew she had a dangerous job. The one-time gang member was trying to get kids out of gangs. She's had guns and knives pulled on her before, but nothing prepared her family for the bloodshed. She came out here to pack some stuff in the van. I heard shots that came running out. I found my mother shot up. Lizaraga was packing for her mother's funeral in Utah. Two masked men rushed to the driveway and opened fire. Police say she was executed. I'm gonna say, you know. To me, it's shocking, you know, it's, dang, you know, it's, it's a trip, you know. Lizaraga often walked the streets of the Ramona Gardens housing project. She, she you know, she treated us like her own sons. And, you know, like every mother, she wants the best for, you know, for her sons, so. She took care of us and tried to lead us in the right way, you know. Police aren't sure why she became a target. They're looking at her work as a gang counselor, but also her work as an advisor to the recent movie, American Me. The film exposed the Mexican mafia. Ah! Oh, Lizaraga is seen here in the movie. The man arrested in her murder is a member of the Mexican mafia. Police say she's the second advisor on the film who's been murdered. Police aren't sure about a connection. Her son doesn't think there is one. I worked, worked on the movie also, and I, nothing's happened. Not, we haven't been threatened or anything like that. Lizaraga saw her sons and daughters turn to gangs. She worried her children were going to be killed. But the mother who turned her life around to fight gangs would be the one to die so violently. In Boyle Heights, Sharon Ito reporting. The Mobsters is a bloody story about a gang of four kids who dominated organized crime in the 20s and 30s when everyone had a gun and nearly everyone had a nickname. Charlie Luciano, the leader of the Mobsters, was known as Lucky Luciano because no matter how hard they tried, no one could kill him. 
Christian Slater, one of America's hottest teen heartthrobs, plays Lucky, and he has a nickname that's rather surprising. Uh, Thumper. What was Thumper from? Thumper is from uh, a girlfriend, actually, that uh, she gave it to me. She gave it to me. In 24 hours, Paranzano comes after us. Newcomer Costas Mandalore plays Frank Costello. He was born and raised in Greece before his family moved to Australia. Kazi the Aussie. I mean, as a child, yeah, there was different nicknames. Kazi, they cut the name in, you know, Kazi the Aussie. I remember that one very well. Give our regards to Don Perizano. TV star Richard Grieco, who has the longest eyelashes in the business, plays the trigger-happy Bugsy Siegel, who got his nickname when he was a kid because he was so annoying. The, the name Bugsy stuck with Benny just because he still was a nuisance and he still was a killer and he, and he that whole thing, and he was mm -hmm. flamboyant. So that stuck with him for the rest of his life, and he hated the, the name mm -hmm. with a passion. Did you ever have a nickname? Um, Richard. That's it? Well, how unimaginative. Yeah. Nobody ever called you Lashes or anything like that? No. <laughs> no, he didn't. You want to start a war? I don't mind. Yeah, well, well, I do. And Patrick Dempsey, who plays Meyer Lansky, doesn't like to be reminded of his nickname. Uh, well, I was called Amoeba for a long time because I was so small. It's one of my all-time favorite nicknames. Thanks for bringing it up. Just about everyone has a nickname they'd rather forget. Excuse me, Mr. Big Sh- This is Sarah Movie Mama Voorhees reporting. Wasan Chang was arrested outside a popular North Broward restaurant. Police say he is the layoff man, a high-ranking member of a Chinese bookmaking operation which made millions. According to police, the operation in Broward was centered in this Deerfield home. Police arrested five people in the home, all for felony bookmaking. Very simple setup, very well organized. A small desk, two telephones that were tape recorded, and sheets like these, all the American and National League baseball games, plus basketball. They say the bets that came into this room totaled in the millions. People that are here can be charged with bookmaking and possession of gambling. That's what you've been charged with. As Broward Sheriff's deputies were making these arrests, simultaneous raids were being conducted in Orlando and Boca Raton. All of those arrested in Broward are Chinese citizens who moved here from Hong Kong. I'm going to trust that what, what I tell you is what you tell her. We are uh, here today to announce the return by a federal grand jury of a 42-count indictment charging 20 Chicago-area defendants in connection with the activities of a racketeering enterprise of the Chicago Crime Syndicate known as the Joseph Ferriola Street Crew. The indictment returned by the grand jury marks the culmination of eight years of work by federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies and evidences our continued strong commitment to the fight against organized crime. Uh, this 42-count indictment begins with a 12-defendant racketeering conspiracy. The indictment charges 12 defendants uh, led by defendant Rocky and Felice and the others with operating a street crew, which is described in the indictment as a faction of the Chicago outfit. The indictment describes how the Ferriola street crew, headed by various bosses, existed to make money by engaging in a variety of criminal activities, including gambling, extortion, and juice loans. They protected their hold through obstruction of justice, bribery, and even murder. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the Attorney General of the United States. Thank you, Ira. I want to begin on a personal note and observe that uh, in my uh, career as a law enforcement... Uh, He's back. Bruce Cutler, the outspoken attorney who kept John Gotti Sr. out of jail for years, has returned. Today, he joined a defense team trying to keep Gotti's son, John Jr., from ending up like his dad behind bars. It always you. feels great to be in the arena uh, and fighting and uh, doing battle, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to it. Cutler was on the John Gotti Sr. defense team that won one court dismissal and two jury acquittals before the government finally nailed the Teflon Don. Five years ago, Cutler was disqualified from Gotti Sr.'s final trial, resulting in a life sentence for the dapper Don. Today, at Federal District Court in White Plains, Cutler greeted his new client, Junior, with a kiss on the cheek. We feel well, we're going to win, so we want to get a fast trial. 
Junior is being held pending his trial on racketeering and extortion charges, along with 22 other reputed Gambino crime family members. His other lead counsel today pushed for a speedy trial for Junior. We want something that the Constitution says that we're entitled to, and that's a, a, a speedy trial. Government prosecutors say they have close to 7,000 audio and videotapes incriminating Gotti and his co-defendants. The court ordered the defense team to pay $20,000 just to get copies of the tapes. The government uh, gathered a lot of evidence, and now the government's saying, if you want the evidence that we're going to rely on a trial, you have to pay for it. That's silly, too. The defense wants a trial date as early as May or June. Prosecutors have offered six defendants plea bargains. So it looks like Junior will have to sit in prison for months yet before Cutler gets to try his magic once again before a jury. Chris O'Donoghue, UPN 9 News. The hefty ruling said Stephen Flemmie did not get blanket immunity from the FBI. He still faces racketeering charges. But information gained from wiretaps and used against Flemmie might be tossed out because the FBI made promises and that agreement was violated. When the government and its representatives make a promise to a citizen, that promise will be enforced by the courts. Stephen Flemmie and James Whitey Bulger became informants nearly 30 years ago. Critics believe, and now the judge has agreed, the FBI knew the two were committing crimes, but allowed them to continue as long as they reported on the mob. Attorneys for co-defendants like Frank Salemi want his charges dropped, claiming Flemmie and Bulger were acting for the government. They strongly criticized the FBI. The FBI knew that Halloran, Wheeler, Callahan had been murdered by Bulger and Fleming, and yet not only did they continue their relationship with these guys, they helped and assisted them in evading any capture. I don't think that anything should be swept under the rug. I think all of it should come out. Um, the truth should come out, and that's what this is all about. This is good for everyone. It's certainly good, uh, I believe, in the long run uh, for the FBI, uh, the Justice Department. And most importantly, for the, for the public. Sergeant Ernest Vitolo, along with officers Miguel Panis, Francis Mazella and Kenneth Dunn were arraigned Friday after a five-month investigation by Internal Affairs found the cops were allegedly doing illegal favors for a social club owner linked to the mob. Police say the cops, all from the 62nd Precinct in Bensonhurst, hung out at the nearby cafe while they were on duty. They allegedly fixed the owner's parking tickets, turned a blind eye to his gambling operation, and allowed the unlicensed clubs to stay open all while accepting stolen property and other gratuities from the owner. What we did is we put together a sting operation. We set up the gratuities, we set up the tickets, and they took them from undercover IAB investigators, and we arrested them for official misconduct and taking gratuities. The cafe owner, John Diana, was also arrested and charged with illegal gambling and running an unlicensed club. The IAB investigation began on a tip from other police officers at the 62nd Precinct. I'm very gratified that other police officers felt compelled to come forward and bring this information to us, and that's how we made this case. Residents in the neighborhood had mixed reaction to the news. I'm very surprised. I couldn't believe it. It was distressing because the cops were involved. Uh, they were there to help you. Instead, they were uh, putting a hand in the, uh, the cookie jar. A couple of people I know are officers in the precinct, and they're a bunch of good guys. So uh, it's a shock just to hear something like this. <laughs> Nothing surprises me anymore. Let me put it that way. I'm too old to be surprised. <laughs> All four cops pleaded not guilty and were released on their own recognizance. Meanwhile, three other sergeants and an officer were placed on modified duty as the investigation continues. In Bensonhurst, Janine Aguirre, New York One. Authorities say this is the face of the mob, reputed gangsters and corrupt union leaders who allegedly siphon millions of dollars from public and private, as well as public construction projects throughout the city. Organized crime has had its tentacles in the construction industry in New York for, for a long time. Uh, and despite uh, law enforcement successes over the years, today's indictment demonstrates that the fight against organized crime is far from over. 38 men, including Stephen Crea, alleged acting boss of the Lucchese crime family and the heads of the Carpenters and Bricklayers unions, were hit with a 57-count indictment. Prosecutors charged they bribed contractors who were supposed to use union workers at union pay and got them to use non-union workers at low pay. Then they built public agencies and private developers as if they complied with the law. The projects included work on the Queensboro and Triborough Bridges and three schools. 
Investigators say corrupt contractors imposed a so-called mob tax and employed main members of the Lucchese crime family as no-show, no-work employees. A no-show job means that the employee doesn't have to appear on site but gets paid anyway. And no-work means that the employee doesn't necessarily have to do any work but gets paid anyway. Police Commissioner Bernard Carrick says the investigation spanned three years. And I think it sends a clear message to the construction industry that we're not going to tolerate criminal activity, the influence of organized crime, and, uh, and I think it sends a pretty good message to the, the legitimate uh, construction people out there uh, that want to compete in the bidding process, that want to compete in different projects. Um, somebody there looking out for your interests as well. The defendants are all due back in court September 27th. In Manhattan, Adele Samargo, New York 1. It was just a few feet from the cleaned up harbor on a cleaned up beach conveniently located to the expressway in Dorchester. But he wasn't a body anymore, but simply a collection of bones. And they didn't belong to the family of missing, then young and beautiful Debbie Davis, a girlfriend of mobster Stephen Fleming, who was suspected of murdering her in a rage in 1981. I told them that my family's sick and, we, and, and uh, it's been 19 years. How much longer do we have to wait for any kind of answers, you know? It would be longer for the Davises because the remains belong to a male, not a female. And police knew who they were looking for when they arrived. Every time we take a step, no. we find more and more police. Push it on. There probably are a lot more pieces. And the state police investigators are really sifting through the sands of time into murders and cases that long predate most of them. Prominent among the missing is Paul McGonigal, gone for a quarter century. McGonigal was a member of the Mullins gang in South Boston, as was Whitey Bulger, who wanted to take over all of South Boston. In a gang war over shaking down bookmakers and drug dealers, police believe Bulger had McGonagall murdered, and the suspected gunman was Patrick Knee, who was out on the streets of Southie today after serving time for an Brian attempted McIntyre, bank robbery. Then there's Tommy King, another member of the Mullins gang, who is popularly recounted as the only man to give Whitey Bulger a beating, which was interrupted by John Martirano, who has admitted to the federal authorities that he killed King in the act. In hindsight, Gigi Portala once told me the only reason the federal government ever got to arrest him was because they had planted a microchip in his rear end and then tailed him by satellite. Gigi Portala Marino sits in jail now, awaiting trial on enough charges that theoretically he could spend the rest of his life in prison, die, and have his corpse locked up for more than a century. It all started when the would-be head of the mob was shot in the butt talks. It was 1996 when drug dealers who owed him money shot him execution style. Only they missed as badly with their aim as they had with their payments and Gigi landed bottom side up in a hospital where the bullet came out, but did something go back in? Did they tell him that they implanted it during his surgery? Yes, they did. Once out of the hospital, Gigi Portella headed to Arizona, allegedly to buy cocaine. His room was bugged, his phone was bugged, his car was bugged, and his lifelong friend on the right who took this photo was wired. But Gigi blamed the chip. Gigi was arrested upon his return to Logan Airport. And according to our sources, he turned to a DEA agent at the time and said, how did you get me? And that agent, wanting to pull his leg, said, because we planted a chip in your butt. And later, when Portala was being booked, the DEA has admitted he was approached by a DEA agent with a release form, asking him to sign it so the government could remove that chip. And if they're going to make these kinds of statements, um, uh, it's going to call into question whether or not they're telling the truth. The federal judge agreed and ordered the government to respond in brief and tell Gigi whether it put that chip where the sun doesn't shine. The case first came to the public's attention in March of 99. A young woman's body, brutally murdered and stuffed into a stereo box, then dumped into the Everglades. She would be identified as 22-year-old Jeanette Smith. She had been bound around the ankles with shoelaces, hands tied behind her back, throat had been, neck had been broken. There were cuts, lacerations, bruises, all about her body. Police would trace the stereo box to Ariel Hernandez, who claimed he picked up Smith at the dollhouse where she worked as an exotic dancer. 
He claimed he paid her $500 for half a day and that she died as a result of rough sex. Now federal investigators say her death was linked to the Gambino crime family. Ariel Hernandez was a member of that crew. It also is revealed that he was indeed the murderer and that the murder was sanctioned by the Gambino crime family and was committed to, mur uh, to further their business here in South Florida. Prosecutors say the stereo was purchased through an elaborate check fraud scheme being operated out of a restaurant, Beachside Mario's in Sunny Isles, and it was tied to a check cashing outlet in Wilton Manors. Not only that, but they say the nine people arrested were operating a loan sharking racket. Various members were organizers, check writers, or leg breakers for the organization. It was headed up, they say, by a man they call Anthony Tony Pep Trenta Costa out of Atlanta. But just why a 22-year-old dancer was killed for the betterment of the Gambino crime family or La Cosa Nostra, investigators are not ready to say. We are not going to comment on that at this time. Prosecutors say Steve Rafa, known as Uncle Steve in the Traficante family of La Cosa Nostra, ran the mob South Florida operations, using its crew and associates to engage in racketeering and loan sharking, bookmaking and illegal gambling, money laundering, and other organized crimes. The feds say Margate police officer Charles Clay was on the wrong side of the law, serving as a paid informant for the mob, letting them know when they were being watched. The mob has to know that we are not going away. South Florida will not, I repeat, we will not be La Cosa Nostra's backyard. The feds say the organization would use check cashing stores in several Broward County communities, including this one in Wilton Manors and this one in Oakland Park, to launder their gambling, extortion, and fraud proceeds. As a result of the expertise of the IRS special agents who followed the money, this task force was able to trace laundering of over $30 million over a five-month period. Prosecutors say the suspected mobsters made in excess of $60 million in various investment scams over the last few years because of the illegal endeavors in which its alleged members and associates have taken part, from those accused of running the operation to those accused of carrying out orders. Today, uh, we hit a home run, okay? We put down a major organization, but law enforcement here realizes we're not done yet. It's going to be a long game, it's going to be extra innings, but this is another big day for us. Thank you. The notorious mobster Stephen the Rifleman Flemmy sat in court ready to accept a 10-year prison sentence in exchange for the dismissal of dozens of charges against him, including four charges of murder. The paradox is that Flemmy was in fact a top echelon FBI informant for more than 30 years, throughout almost all his life of crime. And if he had gone to trial on these charges, the case probably would have painted a much worse picture of the law enforcement agents who protected Flemmy than the mobster himself. After Flemmy accepted the 10-year deal, the judge read a lengthy statement that acknowledged Flemmy's so-called authorization defense, meaning the FBI had given him permission to commit these crimes in exchange for his services as an informant. Quote, this case is a symptom of the culture of the FBI. Flemmy's attorney agrees that this case continues to reveal FBI misconduct, the likes of which would have been inconceivable only a few years ago. Al Flemmy continues to face charges for 10 other murders and several other crimes committed after 1974, crimes which the judge said probably never would have happened if Flemmy had not been working for the FBI because he would have been dead or in jail. Quote, if Mr. Flemmy has committed any of the crimes with which he remains charged, he did so largely because of the protection of the FBI. Today, Mr. Flemmy was sentenced. The acting U.S. attorney, however, says there's no systemic problem. Edward James Olmos received an honorary doctorate at Occidental College on Sunday. Through the imagery of film and the power of theater, you've told the story of the human spirit. But in telling of the human spirit, has the famed director and actor put his own life in danger? American Me was almost brutal tale of life inside a Chicano prison gang. Now the LA Times is reporting that more than a year after the film's release, there are signs the Mexican mafia may want almost dead because of the way gang members were portrayed in the movie and that Olmos is living in fear of being assassinated 24 hours a day. 
through his agent, almost declined to be interviewed for this story. Whoa. And in Sunday's graduation speech, only a vague reference to the tensions of the last year. I've been moved to tears a lot in the last year, but most of them have been tears of sorrow. Some of those tears were shed over the killing of Anna Lizaraga, an advisor on American Me, who was killed two months after the film's release. Several sources say the attack was meant as a message to Olmos, and the Times says there have been other threats, even a lawsuit by an ex-Mexican mafia member offended by the film. Early this year, Olmos applied and then was turned down for a permit to carry a concealed weapon. While police say his fears may be real, they say there's not enough evidence to launch an investigation. And there's nothing currently taking place uh, that's, that we're able to substantiate a true threat to his life right now. You say diversity is hard to take. We Almost may be a marked man, but he's also a man who can't stay away from the public. With or without a gun, he's not hiding. Sylvia Lopez, Channel 9 News. Following that conviction, the United States Attorney's Office and the FBI conducted an extensive grand jury investigation which led to this indictment. I want to rem remind everyone that the indictment itself is not evidence. The defendants committed the crimes charged and that like all defendants they are presumed innocent until the government meets its burden in court of proving guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Those are my comments. Uh, Joe, do you have any comments? Yes. Can you move the mic, please? Sure. sure. The investigation has, has determined that Chicago organized crime has targeted San Diego County as, as, a, as an area for various mob-controlled illegal activities. Today's indictment shows that the FBI and San Diego law enforcement stand ready to meet the challenge of this insidious intrusion. Legalized gambling has had an unfortunate history of attracting organized crime elements. In this case, the spectacular expansion of Indian gaming enterprises has created a natural target for organized crime figures and their henchmen. The indictment illustrates that San Diego is also a major metropolitan area with all of the problems that are associated with that status. Unfortunately, one indictment, no matter how significant, will not deter future attempts by organized crime families to exert their influence in a target-rich environment such as Indian gaming. But the San Diego law enforcement community, however, is prepared to face any such challenge. Thank you. Our last information is that all the defendants are in custody with the exception of uh, Carmen D'Annunzio in Los Angeles. Where is uh, Chris Petty is currently uh, downstairs, I believe, and uh, probably will be arraigned at the 10.30 arraignment this morning. Who uh, represents? Oscar Goodman represented Chris Petty in the last court proceedings in the uh, uh, indictment and the conviction last year. Uh, I don't know whether Mr. Goodman will be representing him again on this case. I believe Nicholas Simarusti will be representing him at the arraignment. The defendants range from prominent lawyers like Michael Friedman, husband of Tampa Mayor Sandy Friedman, to former Tampa City Council Chairman Lee Duncan, reputed mafia figures. But at the top of the list, key bank lawyer Michael Friedman. 15 arrests in all, and a gauntlet for the lead prosecutor, Lee Atkinson. But Key Bank was a small Tampa bank. Tampa is what Tampa has always been. Tampa is a city that has lived and thrived and had its problems because of its reliance upon associations, relationships, long-standing uh, relationships with people who interact together. And that, therefore, it's a slice of life of Tampa. A slice of life local, state, and federal investigators expect to be working on for a long time to come. Bonnie Tischler is the U.S. Customs Chief in Tampa. You know, one of the reasons this investigation continues to be of interest to this community is that any community must have faith and trust in its institutions and in the people who run them. The fraudulent and illegal activities charged today are the first loose threads in a multi-agency investigation which will unravel a tangled web of fraud and deceit. This is Warren Ellie. Police report. say 63-year-old Hugh Wong probably didn't know what hit him the night of September 24th when he was shot repeatedly at close range. At the time, he was inside his car preparing to leave his Richfield home. 
The leads have been few, but investigators knew Wong had recently asked for renewal of his gun permit because he believed his life had been threatened. That belief stemmed from a 1980 incident at the On Leong Club in Minneapolis. A Chinese New Year's party was disrupted there by a half dozen Chinese youths from the East Coast who wanted patrons to strip and hand over their jewels and money. Wong managed to shoot one of them, and there was talk of retribution. But detectives believe four years is a long time to wait for someone to get even, and there is a new theory. We've developed information that leads us to believe that he was acting in the capacity of a security guard down at the An Leong uh, Association in Minneapolis, and that he was providing those services uh, to uh, protect the individuals down there who were involved in the gambling. Indeed, at the time Wong was killed, he was carrying with him a semi-automatic pistol, an M1 carbine, and a 357 revolver with over 500 rounds of ammunition. Police don't know why gambling may have led to Wong's death, but they say the investigation points to a recent increase in three types of gambling at the On Leong Club. Mahjong, uh, another one is a game called Pai Kao, which is a domino type of game. And the third one is uh, Fontan, which uh, involves uh, some type of uh, bean and uh, accounting. Furthermore, in a researcher's book about the Chinese mafia, On Leong is listed as one of the three Chinese secret societies nationwide with ties to gambling. Investigators are now centering in on at least three material witnesses with knowledge of the Wong murder. All reportedly gambled here at the On Leong Club, but are actually from the East Coast. Police refuse to call the men suspects as yet, but clearly believe they have knowledge as to why Hugh Wong was executed. In Minneapolis, Tom Garrison, Channel 5 Eyewitness News.